webinar is titled, High Tech Trash, Sustainability Challenges and Consumer Electronics. Our presenter today is Dr. Kelly Babbitt, Associate Professor of Sustainability here at RIT. Dr. Babbitt teaches courses in industrial ecology, sustainable product design, life cycle assessment, and sustainable food, energy, water systems for RIT's Golisano Institute for Sustainability's Master's and PhD programs. She conducts research on the environmental implications of emerging technologies, including consumer electronics, nanomaterials, and lithium-ion batteries. Her research and teaching have been recognized by the National Science Foundation's Faculty Early Career Development Program Award in 2013 and the AT&T Technology and Environment Award in 2011. Her students describe her as a passionate and energetic teacher committed to helping students succeed. When Dr. Babbitt is not busy working with her students or on research, she enjoys working with K-12 classes to bring sustainability into their schools. Prior to coming to RIT, Dr. Babbitt was a postdoctoral research associate at Arizona State University. She received her doctorate and master's degree in environmental engineering from the University of Florida and her bachelor's degree in chemical engineering from Georgia Institute of Technology. We can't thank Callie enough for joining us today. Let's get going. Hi, thank you all so much for having me and I, I hope, thank you so much for having me. I hope that everyone um, can hear me okay and we'll look for any um, notification or chat if you can't. Uh, before I start, I really want to acknowledge the many collaborators and students here at RIT that, um, whose work will be part of what you're seeing today, and they're a valuable part of our research. So um, in the vein of students, I will first mention that I am a faculty here, as Cindy mentioned, in the Golisano Institute for Sustainability. Um, if you haven't been by recently to see the building, we invite all of you to come by and see some of the very cool sustainable technologies in action. Our program is primarily oriented at training graduate students, and we have a master's and PhD program in sustainability and a master of architecture program with an emphasis on sustainable development. We actually are still taking applicants to the master's program for this fall and I encourage you all to reach out or connect us with anyone you may know who's looking for professional training to help them solve global challenges like the e-waste issue that we'll be talking about today. So I get a lot of questions about what we do here in sustainability and there are many different types of research projects that we have going on tackling everything from energy to waste to recycling and remanufacturing to supply chain management and social engagement to minimize impacts to water, um, energy, and food systems. Um, and there's three ways that I would describe that our program. First, I would say that what we try to do in sustainability is optimize competing objectives. And so what you see here is a three-legged stool. And the three legs of the sustainability stool are the planet, people, and prosperity, or environment, society, and economy. And if you cut off any one leg of that stool, it would not stay upright. And the same is true for sustainability. A technology or solution is only sustainable if it's able to accomplish these three goals. So we're really trying to design green technology that's also good for job creation and economic growth. Um, another way that, that we describe sustainability is that we're thinking very long term, not only what's happening in our lifetime, but for future generations. And I really love the Stephen Covey quote, begin with the end in mind, to describe this, uh, namely that when we're thinking about designing a product or choosing a material, we have to be cognizant of where it may end up in its life, how it will be used, how it will be recycled. And what will the long-term implications of its use be? And finally, um, a key aspect of our graduate program in sustainability and all of our research is that sustainability is a, being applied to take a systems perspective. So when we make a decision about a technology, for example, purchasing a new consumer electronic, using it or recycling it, the impacts that are created by those decisions ripple out all across the product life cycle, all of the way from mining the materials uh, from the earth, manufacturing them into goods and services, transporting them uh, over wide distances, 
distributing them in their packaging, using them, and then ultimately managing them at the end of life, which hopefully includes recycling to close this loop. So this idea of a systems perspective is captured by what we call life cycle thinking. So we're trying to understand the entire life cycle of a product, all the way from cradle to grave, or hopefully cradle to cradle. Now, it's easy to adopt this life cycle thinking for some products. For example, we're all very conscious about our food that we eat. Where does it come from? Who was helping to grow it and the social impacts there? It, does it have pesticides? Is it clean? You know, how are the food safety issues? We're thinking about a lot of those issues all the time because it's something that directly affects us. Similarly, we might ask questions like this, life cycle thinking for making decisions about things we buy. For example, if I'm in the, the hardware store and I'm faced with a traditional light bulb, a slightly more expensive compact fluorescent bulb, or an even more expensive LED bulb, I'm thinking about which one of these products is better, where, you know, where do I do with them when they, do I have to recycle them when they reach their end of life, and do they save energy while I'm using them and thus save costs at home? But there's a lot of products that we interact with every day that we never give the same kind of consideration for. You know, if you think about your electronics, they're merely a tool. Something that you're, you're using and it's enabling you to, to work, but we don't often think about their entire life cycle or what happens to them when we're done with them. So electronics are a fascinating case study because they have such potential for wide benefit. For example, global deployment of information and communication technology can help social benefit around the world. For example, uh, connecting farmers and economies in transition to real-time pricing data to help them make effective decisions about their crops. Maybe closer to home, we might be thinking about using smart technologies in our home, like the smart thermostat, which enables us to hopefully minimize home energy use both so saving us uh, money and also helping the environment. But the question becomes, at what cost is this benefit and is it worth it? And so let's actually talk about the life cycle of a consumer electronic. The materials that they contain are diverse and many of them are scarce, valuable raw materials. This nice infographic um, shows all of the different elements that are contained in a smartphone. And typically, this is true for all of your electronics. You have precious metals, rare earth and critical elements, and even things like lead and mercury and other hazardous compounds. They're not necessarily going to cause you any harm inside the computer, but they may be released later on or in their mining phases if, if they're not managed correctly. So it's a complex mix of very um, different materials that each have a very different sustainability issue. When we then convert those materials into products, um, there's a lot of energy that goes into those high-tech systems. Um, for example, um, one of my colleagues uh, here at RIT has done some research looking at semiconductor processing. And so for a tiny CPU or RAM chip in your computer, it might only be a few grams itself. But he actually found that it takes about 1.7 kilograms of resources and fuels just to make that tiny semiconductor. And all around the world where these are being manufactured, there's growing concerns about human health impact and the energy intensive nature of manufacturing. Once these products are manufactured, then we have to get them to consumers. And I'm just as big a fan as Amazon Prime two-day shipping as probably many of you are, but this type of rapid transportation of goods to their consumers has significant environmental impact, especially if we're trying to rush these products around and require more air transportation. We also have to think about the packaging that they come in and the infrastructure for distributing them. And then finally, the, the part that maybe is most relevant to us as consumers is what happens when we actually use these products. Um, there's been a ton of work happening in, in policy and design over the last several years to try to reduce the amount of energy that a, a consumer electronic uses when it's in standby mode. 
But if you're anything like me, you probably don't leave your, your phone in standby mode for very long between checking emails and texts. So we're not, we're, we're using products more in an active use, and that active use actually has an increasing energy intensity because we're streaming more media, um, gaming, and the smart, um, everything that makes up Internet of Things, which are a lot of always-on products that are consuming electricity all the time. And then there's also a consumer behavior factor. One of the students here at GIS um, has done research looking at the differences in the way these products are used and found that 14% of the U.S. population watches eight hours of TV a day, which is hard to imagine, but it's certainly important to think about when designing these products. And finally, um, when these products are at their end of life, whether because they break, uh, no longer provide the functionality needed, or a cool new product is introduced that we have to have, then we have to think about managing them in the waste stream. And so when you do a Google search for e-waste or electronic waste management, you see a lot of the photos like the one on the screen where we have this mountain full of broken desktops and, and laptops and phones and monitors. And this is an issue that got a lot of global attention, some of it rightly so, and I, I will admit that some of the attention is somewhat sensationalized. But in general, the issue we have here is that these electronics do contain valuable materials like gold, platinum, and copper. However, they're in very tiny concentrations, and they're distributed across all the different components in the product which means that you have to go through a lot of low-value materials, like plastic, in order to get to those um, valuable materials. In the United States, we don't necessarily have a labor force uh, that is able to do that in a cost-effective way, and that's resulted in a lot of material being shipped overseas into what are called informal recycling systems. Um, although there are many high-tech systems that exist, and in most cases, if you in the U.S. take your, your product to a recycler, there's an increasing likelihood that we'll end up in more of a high-tech system, not in the mountains of e-waste we see here. But it also depends on you taking the product to be recycled, and we know that about 30% of electronics are recycled. The remaining ones are thrown away or kept in our old junk drawers at home. And a big part of this challenge, as I mentioned, is that e-waste itself is very complex. So there's a beautiful photo here um, of a disassembled uh, digital camera. And it's unlikely that a recycler would ever actually disassemble a product to this level, but it's clear that there's only a few components, like the circuit boards, which are the green um, boards shown there, will they're only present in a very small amount, and the rest of the material has lower value. So to get to the products that you want, there's a lot of disassembly or, or processing required with a, a relatively low efficiency of extraction. And the, the challenge is also that these products contain both valuable and hazardous materials. So when we looked at the average composition of electronic waste of all the things coming out of U.S. homes in 2015, which includes smartphones and old CRT or cathode ray tube televisions, flat panels, et cetera, um, this graph shows the, the relative material composition. Um, and you can see that a large part of this is made up of base materials like steel as well as plastics. Um, a big chunk of this is still being made up of cathode ray tube television glass. And those old bulky TVs last a really long time. They're heavy. Uh, people tend to store them in their attics rather than taking them to be recycled. And so there's still a lot of those entering the waste stream, even though they're no longer being sold. And you can see as a result of that, the lead that's contained in those televisions is about 2% of the e-waste stream, which is a challenge for safety and health of workers who are disassembling and managing the recycling process. Uh, circuit boards make up about 9% of this material stream, and that's where a lot of the most valuable materials are contained. And so you have to deal with a lot of material to get to the most valuable components. And so if this material 
does end up going into what we call an informal recycling or unregulated recycling route, then we have to start thinking about the potential issues. And so the Basel Action Network has put out a lot of photos and, and information on this, and you see things like um, burning of um, wires. To get it this tiny amount of copper inside, you have to burn off the coatings on the outside. These historically have been made with PVC, which may release the chloride um, or, other, or other harmful chemicals when they're burned. Um, you also see acid treatment of circuit boards to extract the gold from that. You get a very low recovery rate, but labor costs are very cheap, and the economies in many of these regions are such that even getting a tiny amount of gold out still makes it economically valuable for workers. However, there's no control over the human health and safety issues happening in, in many of these um, areas. So it may end up going into one of these types of places if it's not, if an electronic product is not reused or recycled correctly. Now there is, however, a lot of opportunity for reuse. And so there's a lot of interest in this notion of bridging the digital divide. So if you look at developed countries and then economies in transition, um, mobile phone use. So there's at least one mobile phone per person in the United States, if not more, um, because of all the ones that we accumulate. And it's about half that in, in still in many countries around the world. So one solution that has been put forward is exporting electro used electronics that are still in working condition for um, people in other countries to be able to use for their own social benefit. And um, in, you'll see a lot of information in the news about e-waste management in Accra, Ghana, um, but there's actually a lot of legitimate repair and reuse that happens globally. So it, we're looking at products like very large desktop computers in one of the photos here that we may no longer be willing to buy in a store, but still represents cutting edge technology in other parts of the world. And so one of the big challenges for sustainability is figuring out how do you get materials to go into these reuse streams and not going into the more informal recycling where there's more human health risk. The other challenge is that in, in many of these countries, it's not just the United States and developed countries exporting the waste. Electronics are being used around the world. And so some work presented here by one of my colleagues um, here at RIT um, shows that this is the estimation of, of obsolete computers over a 40-year uh, period. And you can see around between now and 2020, the solid lines, which represent the waste generated in developing countries, will actually exceed the electronic waste generated in uh, developed countries like the United States. So that means that we can't just come up with quick fixes, um, like banning the export of electronic waste. We have to come up with global solutions like developing e-waste recycling and reuse infrastructure globally. And there's a lot of effort around this idea of best of both worlds. So how do you develop recycling infrastructure that capitalizes on low labor costs, but still routes the material to an environmentally friendly process such that you're minimizing any exposure to harmful chemicals to workers involved? And there's been a lot of work done in this area. And so the this, this slide here just shows a snapshot of some of these issues. For example, in the uh, European Union, there is policy around we or waste electrical and electronic equipment that mandate certain recycling targets. In the United States, the, there is more voluntary efforts rather than policy where we might think about um, designing products to use less energy, like Energy Star or EP, which stands for the Environmental Electronic Product Environmental Assessment Tool, which it helps design products to be easily recyclable. But these are mostly voluntary. And in the United States, where policy does exist, it's a patchwork across the United States. So over 30 states have some sort of e-waste recycling policy, but they're all slightly different. They all have different targets methodologies for, for managing it, and different ways of ensuring that the material gets managed effectively. And this diversity can, can introduce some, some challenges. Um, and, but the, the, the bottom line is that most of these 
solutions do in fact work. And what we've seen over time, for example, if you look at a representative product like a laptop computer, um, over time the impact of ma manufacturing and using that product has reduced. Um, we're, even though we're using them more, the, the design to make them more energy efficient have worked, and it, manufacturing has also gotten a lot cleaner in areas in Asia where these products are actually being manufactured. And a lot of the manufacturing processes there have begun to shift from using a lot of coal and other dirty electricity sources to more renewable energy. That means that the product manufacturing is slightly greener um, than it was, say, 10 or 20 years ago. But the bottom line is that even though that one product is getting greener, we keep buying more. And the, this is a photo from the internet, but I could have probably taken a very similar shot um, in our home office at, here in Rochester. Um, and this is an example of what we call the rebound effect in sustainability. When product prices go down and products become more energy efficient and cost efficient to buy and use, we tend to buy more. Um, and our spending actually stays relatively constant. We're just getting more products. And we also are all accumulating products. Um, there are other effects like the um, inheritance effect, which, which indicates that you know, when we first purchased um, that desktop computer in our office, it maybe cost $2,000. Maybe now the same product only costs $800 to replace it. So we imbue value on these products that we own because of historical purchasing, even if we no longer use them. And many consumers simply don't know what to do with used electronics, and so they tend to accumulate, either because they're not sure where to recycle them, they're worried about data security, or they think they may need them if their current product breaks. So we either accumulate more, and as a result, the net environmental impact goes up. So this infographic here shows um, a, about a, a um, 20 year period from 1992 to 2007, um, which looks at the number of electronics per household on average has gone, has, has gone up by about 400% in this small time frame. And the net embodied energy, or the energy that it takes to manufacture and use these products, has significantly increased. Well, what the heck does 16,000 megajoules mean? Um, here's a point of reference. This amount is about 30% of that used by vehicles in the home from, from gasoline consumption in the same time period. And so if we want to reduce the environmental impacts of vehicles, there's a, a, a more um, straightforward solution pathway there, like using more fuel-efficient vehicles, driving uh, more conservatively, and other, uh, other energy efficiency strategies. But if we want to reduce the impact of consumer electronics, that means we have 16 products now that we have to redesign and use um, and, and change the behavior of consumers in lots of different ways. And this number continues to grow up. The current number is about 20 products per household. Um, but this study was done a couple years ago. And so the question becomes, if the environmental impact per product is um, it, or if the number of products we're consuming continues to increase, what does that mean for electronic waste? And so a couple of years ago, there were these very sensational headlines that came out saying that we are headed for an e-waste tsunami. And you may have heard the quote before that electronic waste is the fastest growing waste stream in the United States, or as this news clipping says, on the planet. And so we got to wondering in our research group if we know that the energy use is increasing. What is actually happening to electronic waste? Are all these smartphones and tablets and new devices that we're buying actually contributing more waste? Um, and so what we wanted to do in our research um, at RIT was to say, instead of just trying to design a single product like a laptop to be greener, let them look instead at all the different products that, that people own. And so, it, and then we can answer the question, is the net impact or the net waste generated same, increased, or decreased? And we did this by thinking about products as an ecosystem. 
And this is what we call, this is from the field of industrial ecology, which means that we're taking inspiration from ecological systems and nature as a effective model of sustainability, and we're trying to design products and in, industrial systems to be more like those sustainable ecological and natural systems. So in the same way that a biologist might think about an ecosystem, conserving it and, and, and taking care of it, we want to think about the ecosystem of products that people own. And so we looked at, um, this is a major data collection undertaking, and what we looked at is product consumption, so the number of products that, that are actually being sold in the United States to residential households. We looked at survey data, one of our partners surveys thousands of Americans every year about how many products they own, what they are, how they use them. And from that, we could get some data about how many of these products are actually stored in households and how much e-waste is being generated. Um, we also collected a lot of data about product mass and material content. So my wonderful graduate students have disassembled about 100 different products or maybe more to actually understand the material content inside. And with all of that data, we were able to estimate the cumulative resource demand and e-waste generated. And we looked at this from 1990 to 2015, so about a 25-year period. And I wanted just to talk about some of the key findings from this study and, and, and link them to the sustainability issues of electronics that we just went through. So this kind of represents like the, the cutting-edge knowledge about what's happening in e-waste in the United States. So one issue is that product consumption is in fact growing, but the material footprint is shrinking. So the chart that I'm showing right now is the sales of new products or new technologies into U.S. households. So this is showing the y-axis in units. So in 2015, about 400 million products were sold into households in the United States. And the, the products shown here are the 21 most common products over this time period. Um, and so you can see some interesting trends, such as the huge growth in mobile device consumption, especially smartphones in that dark gray towards the bottom. And not only are smartphones growing, they're also, um, in effect, causing what we, what we call device convergence. So we're buying fewer digital cameras and MP3 players because the smartphones are increasingly having those functionality. That means that fewer products, fewer different types of products are being sold, which is in some ways good for sustainability. Okay. So this graph shows the sales by the number of products. The next graph shows the same thing, but in terms of the mass or the weight of this stream. So now what we're looking at on the y-axis are metric tons of products being sold. And that smartphone where we saw a lot of growth is a tiny fraction because their mass is so much smaller than many of the other products that we consume. You have to buy hundreds of smartphones to uh, reach the same weight of an older cathode ray tube television, which is what these, these CRT displays are what you see in the brown color, um, the CRT TVs and monitor. And then you can see a transition after 2008 or so where the red and orange colors are flat panel displays, like LCD and LED TVs and monitors. And so what we found that was really interesting is that the e-waste, or the, the material, sorry, this is the, the sales of products, is actually beginning to shrink. And most of that is due to the displacement of these old CRT televisions. And you actually see this weird dip in, in 2008. If you think back about 10 years ago, this was the point at which uh, broadcast went to digital, so what they so-called digital conversion. And so CRT televisions were no longer sold, and the products that replaced them, these flat panels, have a significantly lighter mass. And so that has continued over time. For example, LED televisions then have a significantly lower mass than LCD, um, and that can cause continued dematerialization over time. So um, we're consuming less resources is the bottom line from our electronic consumption. Now, now I want to switch and look at the waste stream. And we're, now we're going to look at the waste stream in terms of the material that it contains, but it in effect is all the same products that we just saw. And what we found is that materials of concern like lead and mercury are actually declining. But the material profile is pretty constant. 
So the chart that I'm showing now is actually the electronic waste stream coming out of U.S. households. But instead of being shown as products, now what you're seeing are materials that are in that waste stream. So, for example, in 2015, we had just over 2 million tons of electronic waste generated in the United States. But it's clear when you see data like this that it is no longer the fastest growing waste stream. So if you hear that um, or read that phrase in an article, it's not accurate anymore. Um, the waste stream has actually begun to slow. And, and, and to decline. And states are seeing this in their policy. Um, the different state policies are also beginning to see the same effect. And most of this is because now that we've replaced those big, bulky CRT televisions with our flat panel devices, people are still getting rid of them. There's still, they're still about 30, um, on average, 30% of American households still have one of these somewhere tucked away. Maybe some of you do. Um, but they're beginning to decrease in the waste stream. And the yellow line on this graph is lead that's contained in those displays, and that's also shrinking, which is good news for sustainability of these, these products. Um, but we still see a lot of the other materials are pretty constant, like printed circuit boards, plastics, and steel or ferrous metals. Now, um, and then we, if we dive in to say looking at lead, you can see the same trends are true. So in about 2005, there was about 700,000 metric tons of lead contained in U.S. households, like in stock, in the TVs that were being used. That's rapidly decreased. And in a similar way, the inflow of lead and now the outflow or waste of lead is similarly decreasing. So this is, this is a positive improvement from a sustainability standpoint. But we're always thinking about trade-offs because there's, we do not want to, in, in terms of this life cycle thinking, uh, ignore the potential trade-offs that could be happening here. So one of the issues is that we're buying a lot of these lightweight mobile products and that's consuming less materials, but the materials that are cons being consumed aren't easily recyclable. So lithium-ion batteries are a huge issue here. Um, and, and they have the word lithium in them, so that's what people usually think about. But other materials that they contain, like cobalt, manganese, and graphite, also have some significant sustainability issues in their mining and recycling. So this is a clear area for improvement, um, and it's only going to grow because these are the same kind of batteries that are used in electric vehicles. And so another aspect of our research is looking at, you know, when an electric vehicle battery dies, what do you do with it? And so these batteries, plus those in consumer electronics, represent a significant motivation for both battery recycling technology and policy to encourage that in the United States. And that gets back to this triple bottom line of sustainability. Creating recycling infrastructure creates jobs, creates economic revenue to from material recovery, and most of the materials used in batteries and electronics are mined globally. The United States mines very little, so we're reliant on other countries, and so recycling can provide some domestic mineral security. Another question that the changing electronic waste stream forces us to ask is, what is e-waste? So a TV or printer or a laptop computer are clearly electronics and should go into an electronic waste stream. What about smart glasses or smart shoes or even the smart toothbrush, which monitors how well you brush and sometimes sends it to your dentist, which I'm a little unsure about. Um, but there's a wealth of new products that we're seeing introduced every year that have electronics increasingly integrated into them. And one of the challenges that we're thinking about is what does this mean for sustainability and recycling? So just to point out a couple case studies, um, one that we looked at is fitness trackers. And so here you see one uh, model that we disassembled for identifying material and characterizing the waste and recycling potential. And then I'll flip through a couple more examples. Um, this one is, a, is one that you clip on. Now here is the uh, very familiar wristwatch style fitness tracker and another that attaches to a belt. And in each of these cases, we're seeing a 
lot of challenges associated with the goal of miniaturization. So we don't want to wear bulky fitness trackers on our lot, on our wrists. We want products that are lightweight and easy to use and that we can sweat in and, 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 and do sports in. And so that means we're integrating products like our material like rubber, which is not recycled. And these products are so complex and all the parts are glued together that you can't actually disassemble them for repair or recycling. So one thing that we're thinking about is, you know, how do we help consumers pick products where you could, say, replace the battery um, versus having to throw it away if it breaks? And then how can we design these to be lightweight but still be recyclable at their end of life? Another example we looked at is the question about smart thermostats. And so we just have a nest thermostat here taken apart, and our question was, you know, if we make this product smart, does the addition of, a, of um, more electronics to it actually make it worse for the environment and harder to recycle? Because traditional thermostats do have electronics in them, it's just not to the same degree of sensors and battery and display technology. So what we actually found is that making products smart often has very little environmental impact. So in the graph shown here, this is cumulative energy demand, or what we call embodied energy. So this is all of the energy that it takes to manufacture and mine all the materials that end up going into a thermostat. And the smart thermostat has a slightly different breakdown because it's got a battery and different materials and displays. Um, most of the impact comes from the printed circuit board and the semiconductors that it contains. But you can see here that making it smart only adds a tiny amount of additional environmental impact associated with the manufacturing and mining of those resources. That means that this, the, some of these technologies, if we actually use them in such a way that they say help us reduce energy in our homes, the addition of electronics is probably worth it. But the question still remains, how do we actually recycle it? How do we ensure that consumers are, are buying, using, and disposing of these products in a sustainable way? And so finally, that's one of the points that I wanted to end on is what you can do. Um, so one of the things to think about is when you actually purchase the product. Um, there are certification schemes like EPEAT, um, Electronic Product Environmental Assessment Tool, as well as the US EPA Energy Star Label. So if you go to Best Buy's website, you can actually search for Energy Star products, which use less energy. You can also go to third-party um, sites like iFixit, where they actually rate products based on how easily they are to repair. And there's a lot of information there about how to actually disassemble and repair your own product if you want. And that's really key because there's a lot of energy invested in manufacturing these products. And if we're not actually getting them out for people to reuse them, that means we should use them as long as possible. That's about regular upgrades and maintenance. However, when you're done with your product, don't stick it in a desk drawer. Get it out to a reuse avenue as quickly as possible. The longer it sits in your desk drawer, the more obsolete the technology gets. However, there are opportunities like Dell Reconnect, which is a partner with Goodwill, you can look at Goodwill um, stores in your area and find out if they accept different electronics. And there's an opportunity there for them to be reused or recycled um, as soon as possible. And finally, um, if your product does not have any life left uh, for reuse, then we strongly encourage you to search for a reputable e-waste recycler. So there are two certification schemes to help guide that choice. One is called eStewards. The other is called R2, and you can search for either of those online, enter your zip code, and find a recycler in your area. And this provides a little bit more peace of mind. For example, they, are, um, they have protocols in place for data destruction, so your private information is not maintained. And they also have been certified as having working with um, recyclers that will keep this material in um, a well-managed recycling process. They're not going to end up being burned or, or leached with acid like we saw in some of the photos. Here in Rochester, um, we have a good resource, the Eco Park, which accepts many products um, that you might be interested in recycling. However, I will note that, the, that what we often hear is that um, places like the Eco Park, and then there's other many other companies that will take electronic waste like Best Buy and Staples, one issue that we, that we know is that they don't take televisions, the old CRT boxy televisions, or if they do, they charge a fee. And consumers really balk at that because they say, hey, I spent a lot of 
money on this electronic. It has valuable materials in it. You just told me there was gold in the circuit board. Why should I pay for its recycling? Well, the main reason is because the leaded glass in those old televisions is extremely expensive to recycle. And there's no market for it to be recycled into new monitors because they are no longer being sold anywhere in the world. And so there is a cost now associated with recycling it. Um, but in some places like New York, it's illegal to landfill um, these products. And so it's a cost that we, we think are, is appropriate for the, the actual having to manage these in such a way that they don't cause health issues for us or others around the world. And so these are some strategies um, that you can do, and I certainly welcome any contacts with questions about other, other um, actionable items. Um, but I just want to say in conclusion that electronic waste is a good example of a um, technology system where we have to apply systems thinking or life cycle thinking. If we just think about the electricity use, if we just think about the waste disposal, we miss a lot of those full life cycle issues. And it's a very complex product system um, that, that there's a lot of interaction between product and systems and, and other, other systems that we think about, like electricity generation or recycling infrastructure. Um, sustainability methods and tools are able to help us answer these questions. And so we think that sustainability, even though here we teach it as a discipline, the tools that we're using are widely applicable in many other fields. And so anyone who's interested in, in thinking about how some of these tools might relate to their own work or their own um, research, we'd love to talk about collaboration. And um, it's really essential that we think about proactively managing these technologies. So when computers and TVs were being introduced, no one was thinking about how to recycle them. So what we're now pushing for is let's do that for all kinds of emerging products or else we're going to run into this problem again and again. So how do you recycle a solar panel or a wind turbine or an electric vehicle battery? Um, so if we, if we have the chance to be proactive, we can actually develop infrastructure to avoid some of these same problems that we see for electronic waste. And finally, I just want to acknowledge um, the funding and the students who have been key collaborators. Um, you see a shot here of our, our beautiful sustainability building. And um, like I said, we'd love to have you come visit if any of you are in the area um, or provide more information about the technology that's being demonstrated here. I have several um, contact information here if you're interested in any follow-up questions after the webinar today. And with that, I will conclude and thank you all for joining us. And I look forward to hearing your questions and um, being able to share more information about our research. So thank you again. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Um, if you have questions for Dr. Babbitt, please put them into the chat box so we can get them addressed. A couple things have come in. Um, let's see. Just to the, your last comment there about um, the, the, the research that's been done, are you working with any companies or organizations, Kelly, and how might they be responding to this research? Um, that's a great question. And it's, what's really interesting is that this started as a very theoretical project about um, eight years ago, looking at it theoretically. And some of our research attracted the interest of the Consumer Technology Association, which is formerly the Consumer Electronics Association. They're the ones that put on the big Consumer Electronics Show in Vegas every year. And they are a, a, a group that's comprised of members from many of the manufacturers. And interestingly, today I'm, also, I'm giving a webinar to, to many of their manufacturers as well. And they're thinking about this from a very strategic perspective. Um, one issue for them is public perception. So if um, there is a scandal about electronic waste going into the wrong place or um, not being recycled correctly, they want to avoid the public image issues that, that come up there. Um, they're also thinking about it from a business continuity perspective. As I mentioned, many of the materials used in consumer electronics are somewhat scarce. They're expensive and difficult to extract from mining systems around the world because they're not present in very high concentrations in those mines. Um, and so they're thinking about this idea of what we call urban mining, which is instead of mining, 
developing new mines in nature, trying to mine products that are already in use. And so they're thinking about this from the standpoint of, of how do they actually recycle, better recycle products to get some of these scarce materials out that aren't currently being recycled. And that's from a purely strategic financial decision-making perspective because they want to stay in business as long as possible. Great. Thank you for that. Um, what are your thoughts on the economic factors that push tech companies to release new models of products more and more frequently? Yeah, I mean, and this is where, this is a great question because one of the things that we commonly hear is that, you know, this wouldn't be a problem if there was not issues of planned obsolescence and, and new products being pushed all the time. But it is really fundamentally linked. There's a fundamental linkage between the companies pushing new products and consumer demands for these new products. So the new product introductions wouldn't happen if consumers weren't willing to pay for them. And so it's sort of a chicken and egg issue. Um, and in many cases, this idea of planned obsolescence is in fact not necessarily true it, that companies are designing products to fail or designing products to only last a certain amount of time. What they're doing is they're using the least cost manufacturing processes to make these products because we want them at a lower cost, and that means that there are certain design features and functions that make it hard to repair and recycle them. So again, it's this really tight connection between um, consumer demand and um, the business model for the electronics. And that is where we really believe that policy has an important role to play. If you're thinking about products that um, are um, have to be managed, and, and, and if an electronics company has to pay for that recycling, um, because there's, they're, they're working in a state where there's recycling laws that require them to, to be responsible for their products and pay for their recycling, then there might be an incentive for them to design them to be more um, easily recyclable, and which in turn um, would make the recycling cheaper, which would lower their cost. So there's an opportunity there for some smart policy around that. And then I think there's a, really, a lot of really cool opportunities around product design. We know that people um, have strong preferences about the color of electronic products. No one wants to buy a beige, computer when there's a black or an aluminum shiny model that's available. And so some of this is, is kind of behave, getting into behavioral science about why people perceive different products to be more high quality and more cutting edge. And if we can tap into that research, then we can turn that into product design of, of products that actually people will want to continue using over a long period. So don't you think that tech companies uh, probably should start having some discussions or have some responsibility around this? Because it sounds like a lot of this is driven by business model and marketing. Sure. Um, there, is, there is a lot of opportunity there for informing their, their practices. And one of the challenges that we've identified is also the education space because um, the, the, the designers and the technology developers that are, that are introducing these products don't necessarily have any background in sustainability. And so this is where education programs like that at GIS can kind of push in for improving the design uh, or improving the education of folks that are involved with this technology and design so that they can make choices about um, materials and, and, and attachments and finishes and things that go into all of the, the product design um, from a sustainability perspective. So sustainability, while here at RET, there's a big push for that. At other universities, it's not as big of an emphasis. And so some of what we're doing here is also thinking about how can we develop like modules and materials and share those with other universities so that the next generation of technology developers and designers have these tools and can apply them. How, do, how does the United States stack up against um, other countries in the world when it comes to electronic waste and policies and education, comparatively speaking? Sure. Well, I mean, certainly the European Union has probably the most comprehensive policy where there are requirements that certain percentages of products be recycled, that products containing, say, batteries and our other components be, be managed effectively. So that's a very strong centralized policy, but it's not without its own limitations, especially around um, um, 
how to actually do this and design this infrastructure in a cost-effective way. Um, and the largest precious metal smelter is in, is in Belgium, and that's where a lot of the material from these electronic circuit boards go for the, for the gold and other things to be recovered. In the United States, I mean, it's certainly there's a growing interest in this, but there still is not the same degree of infrastructure. And there's not even technology in the United States to do the final conversion processes of some of these metals. So even if they're collected and disassembled in the United States, often they're still shipped abroad for the final material recovery. Um, and China historically has gotten a bad rap around electronics because that's where a lot of the material has ended up illegally. Um, but they've been very aggressive in policy in the last several years about no longer accepting um, broken or unusable electronics and also issues around imports and exports of plastics and waste plastics from different streams. So with that, I mean, there's obviously always kind of exceptions and, you know, people and companies do still sometimes skirt the law. Uh, but there has been a big push um, from Asian countries to kind of change the, the recycling there. But there will always be disreputable recyclers who still will find other places for it to go, like Africa, uh, which I've got Ghana, um, in South America, and others. So we still have to be very proactive about how do we how do we choose recyclers that are um, environmentally friendly. So do you know of anyone out there who is who is um, being responsible and maybe using? software as a tool to extend the life of hardware, so that, or is it just being driven by business model and profits and bottom lines and, and just the fact that everybody needs the latest and greatest? <laughs> yeah, I mean, there's certainly, I mean, some companies are really thinking about this. For, so, for example, last year Samsung introduced a new type of quantum dot LED television, and, and they're amazing. They're so crisp and clear um, and not ad advertising it, but I was really amazed when I saw the product. So quantum dots are a type of um, nanotechnology, and they can use lots of different materials. They can use cadmium, for example, or other things like indium. So cadmium is a known hazardous material, and they actually invest, decided to invest in the alternate technology to avoid selecting a hazardous material. So I think that there, the companies are very aware of these issues. Most of them are not thinking about you know, just let me sell junk. I mean, they're trying to sell high-quality products because brand loyalty is very important. Um, public image is very important for consumer decisions. Um, but then the, the competing factor is simply, like, what will consumers be willing to pay for? Because some of the technologies and, and material choices that make a product greener also make it more expensive. So that's another place where we can think about some policy mechanisms to help levelize those costs. But there are some um, organizations, and a lot of times there are third parties that are helping with this. So a great example that I mentioned is iFixit. So this is a group where they're not only um, helping inform decisions about how, you know, you can go on there and search for repairability scores for, say, different phones or products, and you can purchase a product that is easily disassemblable, easily able to repair or replace components. And then they also have detailed technical guides and videos that show you exactly how to do it. Now, of course, they then also sell the tools that you need to do it to help support that, but it's a great resource. And so you can, you know, we've all cracked our phone screen, and you can go on and actually see how to repair that yourself. Fascinating. Um, there have been no additional questions have come in, and we only got three, four minutes left. So with that, I'm going to thank Dr. Babbitt and her students for all this great research. It gives us a lot to think about. Um, additional questions can be emailed to ritalum at rit.edu or tweet them to at rit underscore alumni with the hashtag me RIT webinars, and we will get your questions directed over to Dr. Babbitt and get some answers right straight back to you. All participants will receive an email from us in the next few days or within the week with a link to today's recording. Again, thank you to Dr. Babbitt for being our presenter today, and thanks to all of you for participating in today's webinar. Our next webinar will be on Tuesday, June 12th. Please consider joining us for a presentation of RIT instructor Margie Ox, titled Quality Assurance Tools You Can Use. Thanks to all of you for joining. You can exit this webinar by closing your WebEx window, and please let us know what you thought of today's webinar by taking the very brief and anonymous survey, which will pop up when you exit. Thanks, everyone. Have a
have a great day.